Welcome to Reverse Engineering News. I'm your host, Hash, and I can see through the ones and zeros. This week, 3D imaging using x-rays, dumping firmware from an STM32 microchip using a Pi Pico, and a pretty cool reverse engineering toolkit. Now, 3D imaging with x-rays, it's way outside of our price range. It's outside of anyone's price range. The 3D imaging actually takes place at this Swiss light source in Switzerland, part of the Paul Scherer Institute. Matthew Venn, who's known for Zero to ASIC, where he creates an application-specific integrated circuit, his own microchip that he makes from design files, he was able to go to this Swiss light source and have his chip imaged. A 3D model of the silicon wafer itself was built. Now, what's interesting about this is that the imaging technique that's done is something called cytography. That is basically imaging without using a lens. They're imaging things so small using x-rays that they've moved beyond the lens technology, the lens capability, how, how small they can manufacture a lens for this purpose. And they had to come up with a different means. Thomas, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the, the Swiss Light Source, is actually the, the one that's working on this technique there. He has a PhD thesis that he wrote where he details how this works and he actually shows you how you can build a visible light version of this cytography method using a Raspberry Pi and a grid of LEDs that shine light into this thing. Now, the way I've heard it described is that cytography is basically the digital version of imaging. A lens you can think of like an analog imaging device. So a light source shines at something, it's reflected, the lens refocuses that, and that's what you see. Cytography is basically taking a ton of pictures of all of these scattered uh, images, it looks kind of like gibberish basically, reassembling those, doing a bunch of kind of computation on it, and turning it back into an actual sharper image than if you had used a lens. Thomas's PhD thesis is a great read. There's links down in the description to that. And Matthew Venn's walkthrough of the Swiss light source where he shows how these high powered x-rays are generated and how it's ultimately used to image his silicon wafer that he designed. Now onto something we can all afford, a Raspberry Pi Pico firmware dumper. This is based on a paper called One Exploit to Rule Them All, where Johannes and a team of some other people take a look at the STM32F1 and some drop-in replacements from other manufacturers that supposedly are, are firmware compatible and everything. You can basically, instead of buying the STM32, you buy this cheaper version, you drop it in. And they wanted to do analysis to see are there any flaws? Are there any bugs? Can you dump the firmware out of these chips? And do the clones operate in the same way? Or maybe do they have different flaws than what the original STM32 has? What they found is that they're all unique. All these different chips look like they were designed on their own. And they all have separate flaws that they were able to exploit to dump the firmware out of them. Now, the one exploit to rule them all paper is incredibly interesting to read. They break down all the details of how they were able to attack these chips and, and the process they used to dump the firmware. Patrick's GitHub, where he has the Pi Pico flash dumper, is also very interesting to read. He gives great detail of one of those exploit methods and how he re-implemented it in a Raspberry Pi Pico. Originally, they used an STM32 development board to perform this attack. The attack isn't timing critical per se, it's just multiple steps in performing this attack. So it's broken down into three pieces. First, you plug a debug cable into the chip you want to attack, and you load some software into the static RAM, into basically the memory that's lost every time you pull power from the chip. It's not like the flash memory that's saved. You plug your debug cable in, you load some code into there. Now the code you're loading in is basically your exploit that you're going to use to attack this chip but everything in the chip is locked down. The flash memory is locked down. You can't do anything because once it detects that a debug cable is plugged in, it doesn't let you do anything. So you have to power cycle the chip to take it out of that. Now what they did that's very interesting is 
They power cycle the chip, but they do it so fast, they watch the reset line just to see when it falls and they bring power back, that the static RAM doesn't actually clear. So when they bring it back up, they unplug, they've unplugged the debug cable, they change these boot pins. There's boot pins on these STM32s that tell it which mode it's in. Is it booting to the static RAM? Is it booting to flash? It, it lets you set things using just a couple external pins on the chip. So they change it to say boot from the SRAM, but there's no debug cable attached anymore. When it boots up into the SRAM, the lock that was there, because the debug cable is gone, but a different lock exists. The lock now is because you've booted up from static RAM, it still locks you out of flash memory. But what it doesn't lock you out of is this other part of the chip that allows you to patch different things. One of the things it will let you patch is the reset vector. The reset vector of a chip is where the chip goes when you hit the reset line. Where in memory does it jump to? And so if you have a bug or something else, if you need to load some different code in, you can patch it and you can tell these different interrupts to jump to different places. So what the code in the SRAM does is patch this interrupt vector so that when it boots up, instead of going into flash memory, it jumps to the static RAM instead. Now they reset the chip again. When you reset it, it doesn't lose what's in the static RAM. It just stays. They change the boot pins back to normal. They say, just boot up as normal. You're going to boot up from flash now. When it boots up, it immediately jumps to the SRAM where it runs the exploit. The exploit is to just dump all of the code out of the flash through the serial port. It's an awesome attack because you can damn near use any chip that you can program to do this attack. You don't need any kind of high performance timing. It's not like a, a glitch attack where the glitch has to be very precisely timed. All you're doing is just watching the reset line at that one point when you kill power and you bring it back up as soon as you see the reset line falls. So it's awesome. It allows you to dump all of the memory from the chip. Now, all of the other chips, they have all different kinds of attack methods. Some of the clone chips, actually I think all of the clone chips, had separate memory chips that were stacked on top of the processor and connected with bond wires. They even hooked up in the original paper to those bond wires and dump the memory out of the chips. There was a lot of deobfuscation that they had to do, but nonetheless, they were able to get the memory out of it. And finally, this is a file you can download. It's rather large, but it contains all the tools that you would need to do binary analysis in Windows. I don't know if it's all the tools, but it's a lot of them. And it's ready for you to, to download and install. It's kind of like a Kali Linux or a Dragon OS but it's not its own bootable thing. You have to create like a Windows VM. That's how I tested it out. You download the file, you install it in there, and it's everything, Ghidra, all these different hex editors and all this stuff just packaged into one nice deal. It seems to be fairly maintained and, and updated from what I could tell. They tell you, hey, use at your own risk and install in a VM because who knows what kind of uh, software is in there. It comes from all different locations. But I looked at the group themselves uh, they're called Binary Mind. They're based out of Brazil. It seems to be like an educational type of group that that is you know has has as good of intentions as anybody can have. So it's probably a pretty interesting tool to install and check out if you're into binary analysis in Windows, malware analysis, things like that. Make sure you check out the Richesum Discord and Wiki for sharing ideas, documenting things you're working on, just chatting with people that are like you. If you have news stories, you can send them in to hash at richesum.com, or you can find me on Twitter, at bitbangingbytes. Now, I don't mean to brag, but Wiz Khalifa did retweet one of my tweets, so I think I've made it. See ya!